just a little further, though. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, it, it is good to see you all this morning. Uh, praise God you all came that, you know, God's got it in our heart to be here. And here we are at the beginning of the week. It's the first day of the week. It's the Lord's Day. And, and of course, this is where we ought to be. And thank you all so much for coming. Uh, we hope it ends up being a, a fantastic week. But if not, as long as you've been washed in Jesus' most holy and precious blood, amen, 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 that's all that counts. And, uh, you know, before we, before we do get into the message today, uh, I, I'm sure you've probably all heard, or, or many have, uh, which I, I don't know anything as later than last night, but let's, let's definitely keep Israel in prayer. Uh, I, I know full well, a, as you do, Israel's not a perfect nation. We know that uh, just like America, there's, there's major sin issues uh, with Israel, just like there is here, but they are God's chosen people. And that is a forever thing. And for that reason alone is enough reason to keep Israel in prayer. So let's definitely keep them lifted up in prayer. And most importantly, that, that as many as will, uh, will accept God's gift of salvation before the rapture. We know God's going to save a remnant during the tribulation. But let's pray that as many as will won't have to go through that seven years. So let's keep Israel in prayer. And with that said, if you'd open your Bibles up, and let's also keep our pastor. Let's remember to keep our pastor, Brother Dean, in prayer uh, this coming week. And of course, always, and keep one another in prayer. But if you would open your Bibles to First Chronicles chapter 4. 1 Chronicles chapter 4, I've already passed a hurdle right there because many times it's easy for me to say 1 Corinthians when I mean 1 Chronicles. So this is 1 Chronicles chapter 4. And as we start into the, the message today, you know, this, this was a thought that, that came to me about how, you know, many of God's men, whether they were prophets or, or what, whatever they happened to be, sometimes we get like with, for instance, Moses or Elijah, Elisha, uh, further along into the Old Testament, prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel, Jeremiah. We get whole, you know, we get chapters and chapters, in some cases books, on these men of God. And, and what, a, what a thing it is to get all that information about these men and how they, they followed God and, and, and the, how God used them so powerfully. But today we're going to look at a man that got two verses. Two verses here in First Chronicles and chapter 4. First Chronicles and chapter 4 this man gets two verses. Now, his name is Jabez. And he shares a name with a place. But as far as I know, these two verses are the only two verses that God tells us anything about this man, Jabez. And yet, with Jabez... It's as important to know about Jabez as it is to know about Moses. It's as important to know about Jabez as it is, say, Ezekiel, even though it's just two verses. And we're going to be looking at prayer today. Prayer today. You know, we usually talk about the three things that we really truly believe is, or I, I truly believe that these three things are a fix and a cure for all that ails the church. There is being in the Word of God every day. There is prayer. And there is the assembling of God's people together to worship collectively. And today we're going to be looking at that second one, 
prayer. So here in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, for those of us who can and will, let us stand for the reading of God's most holy and precious word. We're going to look at verses 9 and 10. And Jabez was more honorable than his brethren. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bear him with sorrow. This seems to be a reference to the giving of birth. This, was, this birth that his mother gave with him was more than the normal sorrowing that went on. And so that's why she named him what she did. And Jabez, verse 10, And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. My Lord and my God, thank thee, Lord God, most of all for thee. Thank thee, God, for thy love, mercies, graces, protections, provisions. Thank thee, God, for, for all that have come today. We thank thee, God, that for those that would love to be here and could not be here, and we ask God for a special touch upon them. We pray, God, for also a touch of, of thee on those that could have been here, Lord, and are not, a touch of conviction. Please, God, just... Lay thy hand upon all thy people. Please, God, help me to get out of thy way and let thee do what only thou canst to do. And that stand behind thy pulpit and deliver thy, thy messages. And please, God, help us just to love thee perfectly. In Jesus' most holy and precious name we do pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, four questions. Four questions as we look at this man named Jabez. How important is it for one of God's children to call upon him? You don't have to turn there, but as we were in the Sunday school lesson, let me read you a, a piece of scripture from, from Mark chapter 1. And let's see how important it is for God's people... You know, we heard about it in, in, in the Sunday school lesson too, how important it is for God to, God's people to be in prayer. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, And in the morning, rising up early while before day, he, meaning Jesus, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. And there prayed. And if it's important for God the Son and the Son of God Jesus Christ, to spend time with His heavenly Father in prayer. God in the flesh, spending time with His Father in prayer, how important is it for us? How important is it for us? Question number two. How important to you and I, as God's children, meaning the church, to call upon Him? How important? Take you to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5. And, and, and see again how important this is. How important that it is to spend time with, with God in prayer. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Now some people might ask, how do I do that? You know, there's, there's things I've got to do throughout the day. My time is is used up. God knows what we've got to do throughout each and every day. And yet there is time in the midst of that to be in prayer. How many of you as you drive up and down the road have spent time in prayer to God? There's time to pray, isn't there? When you, when you lay down your head at night, when you wake up in the morning, as you go through the day, we should be in prayer. Number three, does it take more than salvation to call upon God? And the answer to that question is, yes, it does. Two pieces of Scripture here. In Isaiah, we hear Pastor Dean quote this. And in Isaiah chapter 59, this is, 
This is true for the lost, and it's even true for those of us in the church when we get outside of the will of God. God will not hear our prayers. And in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither His ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. God doesn't listen to the lost in their prayers. God doesn't listen to the saved when we're outside of His will. So we must walk with God for Him to hear us. And this one zeroes it in on us husbands. First Peter. And First Peter, First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. Listen to what God tells husbands. Verse 7, Likewise ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, of course meaning wives, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. If we husbands don't dwell with our wives according to knowledge, if we don't give honor to our wives as unto the weaker vessel, God's not listening to our prayers. Our prayers are hindered. So this subject of prayer is important. And we've looked at these two verses in, in First Chronicles. Let me reread, let us reread them. And Jabez was more honorable than his brethren. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bear him with sorrow. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it be, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. The first thing we see in verse 9 about this man Jabez was he was more honorable than his brethren. He was more honorable than his brethren. That word honorable means... And by the way, one must be saved to be honorable. There is no such thing as a lost honorable person. Qualities of being honorable are honest. One must be honest, truthful. You know, and, and Jesus refers to himself in John 14, 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He calls himself the truth. As we seen Sunday, or last Wednesday, in John 17, 17, Jesus praying for his disciples to the Father. To God the Father says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So to be honorable, one must be truthful. To be truthful, one must know the truth, which is the Lord God Jesus Christ, and must be in the truth, must be in God's Word. Also honorable is without hypocrisy. You know, a false appearance, pretending to be someone that one is not. One can't be that and be honorable. So obviously Jabez was an honest man. Obviously Jabez knew some of the word of God, or God wouldn't have referred to him as honorable above his brethren. You know, and, and that brought the thought to me today, or yesterday, looking at this. We have many pretenders today. There's many pretenders amongst the saved. There's many pretenders amongst the lost. Matter of fact, in truth, all the lost are pretenders. But how about amongst the saved? They're the people that have no interest in the things of God. They're not interested in God's Word. They're not interested in God. They're not interested in the people of God. They're not interested in the Word of God. But they pretend but they're interested in the world and the things therein. They're interested in the world and the things therein. 
Now what about the lost? How's their pretenders there? This brings me no joy to say. But it must be said, because we're living in a day and age in which many pulpits, many pastors, many preachers won't touch on these things. And they must be called out. And we all have family. And we all have family that these things occur in. And yet truth must prevail. Truth must come out. Truth must be spoken. Even when it hurts. And much of the time truth does hurt. the pretenders amongst the lost, so-called sodomite believers, that will say, I'm a gay Christian. There's no such thing. Or the transgendered. You know, where, where are we now? Oh, I can, I can refer to myself however. I can pick what gender I am. You're the gender God assigned you at conception. That's your gender. There's male. There's female. There is no other gender. That's it. And in the same first, you know, first Corinthians chapter six, the same chapter that deals with Sodomites. And this is, this is the good news in it. With the sodomites, the transgendered, or anybody else. God names some sins, and those are included in that list of sins. And then God says, and some were some of you. And such were some of you. In other words, when God got a hold of you, and God saved you, whatever came before is no more. The old man is dead. He's been crucified with Christ. And once you accept God's gift of salvation, you're not a sodomite anymore. Or as 1 Corinthians says, abusers of themselves with mankind. Or with the transgendered, the effeminate. You're not that anymore. So there are pretenders about the, among the saved and the lost being religious does not equal being saved. Everybody is religious. Everybody. Every human being is religious. How many times during the, the days of, not that it's over, mind you, but how many times in the, the, the heat of the coronavirus did we hear people say, well, I trust in the science? Say, they're religious. They don't, they don't trust in God, but they trust in the science. But that means they're religious. Being religious does not equal being saved. We say these things in love first for God because God said it. So that means it must be proclaimed. What was it that uh, God had Paul tell T Timothy? Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. God didn't say, preach what you feel like. God didn't say, preach what you like. God didn't say, don't preach on what's going to stab people in the heart. God didn't say, concern yourselves primarily with people's feelings. God said, preach the word. In season, out of season. 
We say these things in love, first for God, secondly, for the lost. Because they need to hear the truth. It's the only way they'll be saved. How many times have we heard Pastor Dean say, you'll never be saved till you're lost? Meaning you confess the condition that you're in. Well, the only way you're going to confess that condition is by the conviction of the Holy Ghost through the Word of God. We shouldn't make people more comfortable on their way to hell. That's not always a comfortable position to be in for oneself. Because you know when you speak up what people are going to think, what people are going to feel, how people are going to react. But the truth must come out. Now let us look at this, this honorable Jabez, this prayer from this honorable Jabez. That, I think that's what caught me as much as anything. Two verses. Two verses is what God has to say about this man, and yet it tells us much about this man, Jabez. And when we get through today, how would you love for God to be able to say the things about you that he said about Jabez? He was more honorable than his brethren. We read that in verse 9. Let's look at the prayer, verse 10. And Jabez called on the God of Israel. Notice who Jabez called on and who he did not. He called on the one true God, the God of Israel. That's who he called on. He did not call on the false gods of the Ammonites, the Moabites, or the Philistines. He called on the one true God, the God of Israel. A little side note here for those around the world. Because, you know, it's not just Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran, and the others that's coming after Israel. You can see the hatred. You can hear the hatred on college campuses right here in the United States of America. And what they need to do is go back to Genesis chapter 12 and read verses 1 through 3. And in the third verse, God says a promise to Abraham. He says, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. That's what he said. And nowhere do I read after that, that verse that God rescinds that promise. This is the God of Israel. You're not just dealing with the nation of Israel. You're dealing with the God of Israel. And that's who Jabez called out to. He called out to the one true God. He called out to the God of Israel. How many believe today? Or how many today believe, if only one is sincere, and believing in their false God, all is good? You know, I remember a, a sermon not terribly long ago, and I may have the, the title wrong, but it was called something along the lines of sincere, that, past, that God used Pastor Dean. Sincerity does not matter. You can be sincerely wrong. Sincerely wrong. And all these people that believe, you know, again, getting back to truth, Jabez was more honorable. What does honorable mean? It means truth. He was truthful. He knew the one true God, that there was only one true God. He knew Dagon of the Philistines and Molech of the Ammonites and the others were false gods. He wasn't calling on them. He was calling on the God of Israel, the one true God. And by the way, how do we know? How do we know that there's only one God? We're glad you asked take you to Isaiah momentarily. The book of Isaiah. And start off in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 8. Isaiah 44 and verse 8. Listen to these statements by God and what He says. 
Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 8. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. How about Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 18? 45 and verse 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it to be created. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. How about chapter 46 of Isaiah and verse 9? Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. How about chapter 48 and verse 12? Chapter 48 and verse 12. Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he, I am the first, I also am the last. Only God can make that statement. Only God can make that statement. As Pastor Dean proved in, in that sermon that God preached through him powerfully, you can be sincerely wrong. Sincerity is not the mark of salvation. Sincerity is not the mark that you're right with God. You've got to be sincerely right to be right with God. Jabez knew he, who he was calling on. Back to verse 10 of 1 Chronicles chapter 4. And Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me. Indeed. Look, he's, he's looking for God's blessing, not man's blessing. He's not looking for a blessing from people. His focus is on God. That's who he's looking at. God in the flesh. God Almighty. He's looking to God. Not for man's blessing. Oh, how tempting it is, isn't it? to want man's blessing. I remember several years ago, it was before Brother Tracy Nichols was pastoring up at Mount Pisgah. And one Sunday morning, Pastor Dean had Brother Tracy fill in for him here one Sunday morning. I, it was a powerful sermon that God preached through Pastor Tracy. No shock there. And I remember after the sermon, speaking to Brother Tracy and, and saying to him, you know, something to the effect of what a powerful sermon. What a wonderful sermon. And you know what his response was? To God be the glory. To God be the glory was his response. He was taking none of the credit. He wasn't looking for man's approval. I think it would be safe to assume Brother Tracy was looking for God's approval, not man's. So was Jabez. That's where he wanted the blessing to come from. Not man, but from God. Question. Well, let's keep reading here. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed and enlarge my coast. Oh, by the way, Let's back up for a moment. That word blessed, where he's, he's looking for God's blessing. You know, there's a difference between blessed, or let's give you the definition of what blessed means. Blessed means to rejoice, a joy. Blessed. He's looking for God to work in him in such a way that he can rejoice, that he can have joy. Remember what David prayed in Psalm 51? Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. That's being blessed. He wasn't looking to be saved again. Once saved, always saved. What he was looking for was that joy that he had lost. He wanted that joy back. Restore unto me the joy of thy, thy salvation. 
That's what Jabez wanted. He wanted God's joy in his life. There's a difference between joy and happiness. Happiness is based on circumstances. Your team wins the big game, you're happy. You get a good doctor's report, you're happy. You get that promotion at work or that raise at work, you're happy. If you don't, you're not happy. It's conditional. It's based on circumstances. Joy, on the other hand, is unconditional. You can have it when your team wins, your team loses. You can have it when you get good news, bad news at the doctor. You can have it when you get that raise or that promotion or you don't. The joy is still there. And that's what Jabez was looking for. He wanted that. He wanted that. And enlarge my coast. Maybe Jabez was asking for more land. Maybe he was asking for more God in his life. Because that word coast can mean like a border. It can mean territory. Maybe he was asking for land. Maybe he was asking for more God in his life. But whatever it was, it pleased God. As we'll see momentarily, this request pleased God like Solomon. When God appeared to Solomon in a dream, think about this for a moment. If you went home today and tonight when you lay your head on your pillow, God appeared to you in a dream and said, what do you want and I'll give it to you. Imagine that. From What would you ask? What would you ask? Well, that's what God said to Solomon in a dream. What do you want and I'll give it to you. And Solomon humbly said, he brought up his daddy David who had been king. And he said, I'm a child. I don't know how to go out and I don't know how to come in. He said he asked God for wisdom, for an understanding heart to judge God's people. And that pleased God that he had asked such a thing. Now God blessed him with much more than that. But God did bless him with that. God blessed him with that understanding heart to be able to judge his people. And just like that pleased God with Solomon, Jabez pleased God with this, as we'll see. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed and enlarge my coast and that thine hand might be with me. And that thine hand might be with me. That means he wanted God's strength. That meant he wanted God's direction. I don't know if I did or not. Yesterday when I was out here at the church, I was telling Dawn about it after I got home. I started to cross the road towards the church and there was a pickup coming towards 18. Stopped. There was a young lady in the pickup crying. And she said uh, she is looking for directions. She was wanting to know how to get to Lenore. She said, my GPS keeps leading me in circles. I don't know if I pointed or not. But I said, you go down here to 18, make your right turn, and that'll take you straight into Lenore. When Jabez asked for God's hand to be with him, he was asking for God's strength. God's strength. God's hand is mighty. His arm's not shortened that he cannot save. Do you want to be in the hand of God? Jabez did. That's what Jabez desired, and that's what he was praying for. He also wanted direction from God. 
That's what he was asking for. God, show me the way. That's what the hand means. And that's what he was asking for. A couple questions. Do you and I want to face the devil and our strength or God's strength? Amen. Do you and I want to face this world in our strength and leading or God's strength and leading? It's easy to answer, isn't it? Easy questions to answer. Then this next statement. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil. Notice he didn't say to keep evil from me. He said, keep me from evil. Keep me from evil. Why? He didn't want to sin. He didn't want to break one of God's laws. He didn't want to be a lawbreaker against God. He wanted to be right with God. He wanted to do everything that pleased God. That's what this whole prayer was about, was pleasing God. He didn't ask for... Let's read that again, how he worded that. And that thou wouldest keep me from evil. Not keep evil from me, but me from evil. That's what he was praying to the Lord for. Next statement. That it might not grieve me. That it might not grieve me. Grieve means to sorrow. Pain produced by the loss of any good. You know, in these two short verses, what we can say about Jabez was that he was a man who walked with God. And he did not want to stumble... He didn't want to stumble. He didn't want, you know, the word offend or offense can mean to cause to stumble. He didn't want to stumble. He wanted to be right with God. And that's what he was praying for. That's what he prayed for. That it might not grieve me. What was God's response? Last statement of verse 10. And God granted him that which he requested. Why? Why did God grant Jabez what he had requested? And he had requested what? And Jabez called on the, on the God of Israel... One true God saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me. Give me that joy to be with thee. And enlarge my coast. More of God in my life. And that thine hand might be with me to strengthen me and guide me. And that thou wouldest keep me from evil. To keep me walking with thee, Lord. To keep me in thy paths. To keep me right. To keep me clean. Not to keep evil from me, but to keep me from evil. That it might not grieve me. That I would again not have sorrow, but that joy in God. And what was God's response? And God granted him that which he requested. Did you notice something about this prayer? As we went through it. It was all about God. I mean, yes, Jabez was making some personal requests. But who was the focus throughout the entire prayer? God was the focus of the entire prayer, not Jabez. Jabez was, just like with Solomon, Solomon's prayer was for wisdom, not for himself, but so that he could judge God's people. It was all about God and His people. And here Jabez wants to please God. It was all about God. That's what the prayer was about. Again, as we spoke earlier, think about some of God's men throughout God's Word. Men like Moses. 
men like Elijah, Elisha, men like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, we get chapters and books about these men. And rightfully so, because God put it there about these men. Two verses. Two verses for Jabez. But it really wasn't about Jabez at all, was it? It was all about God. When you read and study the Word of God, keep that in mind. It ain't about you and me. It's all about God. And for the lost that may, be, that may hear this later, to show you the love of God, that it is really all about God and not about ourselves. What once upon a time may have been the most famous verse in all of Scripture, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The first two words of that verse tells you who that's all about. For God. It was all about God. This prayer of Jabez was all about God. And if you're listening later by YouTube, Facebook, or however, and you wonder, can I pray to God? and you're lost, and you're undone without God, the answer is no, you cannot. God's not li- Remember Isaiah 59, 1 and 2? God's not listening. Until you cry out, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a promise, shall, not might be, could be, possibly. Shall be saved. What must you believe? You must believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, according to the Scriptures. You must believe that He was buried and rose from the dead on the third day, according to the Scriptures. And if you'll do that, you'll be saved. And then you, just like Jabez, can call upon the name of the Lord the rest of your days. Praise God for that.